uh, application structures and how uh, how it's gonna be uh, used. Um, so this is very old, uh, um, old slide that I use all the time. So it's gonna have some things. Um, so basically we will be looking at uh, what is a monolithic application, okay? And what are microservices? And uh, next thing you will be doing a uh, container orchestration. And uh, let's see uh, whether the microservice architecture will be suffer will be enough for our use cases. Okay. All right. Uh, this is one of the old things um, where I am teaching my kid about microservice. So he's now a genius on microservice. Uh, let's see how it goes with you guys. So probably uh, when we are developing an application, um, you guys must have developed something like this. So it's gonna be a very simple application. Um, most of the time we have a client, we call a browser or a mobile, whatever the application that we are working on. And simply there will be a connection between our application in here, our application and the, um of application uh and the brow uh, browser or mobile we call this client we have a simple connection between these two so we call uh we we have a bridge between those things uh we simply call this api application programming interface most of the time uh, like 99 percent of the time now when we are using it it's going to be something like a rest api or a GraphQL uh, connection that we are doing so API in general uh, is the uh, is the norm that we use to uh, say okay there is a connection between the user within the browser and the uh, with the client and the server so within that we'll be using an API application programming interface to interact with each other and in this scenario this uh, section uh, on the right we'll we'll call this uh, this section as you know we call um, um, the uh, back end okay so most probably you guys have worked with front end like a react js application um ios android application uh, maybe uh, uh, some other framework this kind of thing uh, but uh, in reality, we will be calling uh, what we call a backend service, where we call where we uh, do our business logic and uh, where we store our data in a database. So in this scenario, uh, we'll be developing a simple e-commerce application. At least we'll take the example of uh, developing a simple e-commerce application. So. Uh, these modules, uh, these uh, functionalities between that, uh, be uh, within the uh, application, we will have something like this. We have accounting module where we we calculate all the related accounting data, payrolls, uh, shipment data, GRN data, in, uh, anything related to uh, money or something related to that. Uh, we can have accounting module. And then again, we can have an inventory module, inventory module where we can have all the information about the uh, inventory that we have, such as um, the good received, uh, the current stock, uh, what we have sent so far, and what is uh, what is the uh, things that we have already ordered. That's kind of inventory what um, what we have and what what sort of things we are expecting. And there can be a simple shipping module uh, where we can say, okay, whenever we make a purchase, uh, we need to think about the shipping, uh, where, uh, to whom we will give, he'll be delivering, how we're going to deliver, and those kind of uh, information uh, will be within the uh, shipping module. And same goes to email and SMS module. Uh, whenever one of these things happens, let's say, for example, um, we received a paycheck and we need to send an email uh, for the vendors or something like that. When uh, inventory item is moved, we need to send SMS to someone else. Or when the inventory is low, we need to inform someone in the HR or someone in the procurement to say, okay, this uh, is going low, we better order these things up. 
and there's shipping module probably once uh, we once we are in the shipping process we want to inform the customer we want to inform the company regarding the, all the transaction that has happened we have delivered the uh, your things to the delivery service we have um, we have return we have received your return this kind of thing so any sort of notification that we want to send we can use these email and sms module to send them so these are like bunch of uh, functionalities between uh, within the application uh, and there can be more okay it's it's not going to be like a very uh, simple term uh, if you are building something like that but at least these are the modules that you guys will see um, within an application, uh, within this application. And uh, most of the time we have uh, something called repository. So whenever we want to um, purchase something, that means uh, we want to share, we want to save something within our application. So what we'll do is we will use a database. So uh, probably you guys have used a database such as MongoDB, Postgres, MySQL, whatever the database that you are familiar with. Uh, you can uh, have um, a connection in here uh, with the backend and you can um, send SQL queries or NoSQL queries like insert into, update into. That kind of information will be sent to the database. And if you want to retrieve something, you know, we can have the select queries and um, something similar and we can get back the information uh, to the application we can process them and we can send them directly to the browser of the mobile so this is kind of the basic architecture that you look in uh, if you look into a um, uh, simple uh, monolithic application so this is not bounded by any technology, any stack or anything like that. Um, this is like the architectural pattern that we are speaking. So you can have anything that you like with the mobile client, any framework of choice for the backend processing, any database type that you can work with. But basically, this is the flow of an application. Uh, once a client requests, um, server respond, but uh, in order to respond, the server might need some additional data, which will fetch from the database. The database will give it back, and the server will send it back. So this kind of architecture um, is most commonly used within the industry. So if you have already developed something, probably this will be the 99% of the time. This will be your architecture of choice uh, that you have developed uh, to uh, uh, to uh, uh, fulfill your needs or API or something like that. So um, let's see what what's what's uh, what what, uh, what sort of uh, advantages and disadvantages we have within this application architecture. So the pros uh, is simple to develop and uh, test and maintain. So you guys, um, if you guys know. Um, when the uh, modules are developed, accounting module, inventory module, and shipping module, all these things is within one single code base, within one single place. So whenever we want to develop something, it's it's going to be really simple to access over there. And it will be easy for testing out since uh, the uh, the modules are, uh, modules are within one single code base. We can directly call these um, services anytime we like, okay? We, the county module can uh, directly call to the email service. Um, normally this happens, um, the communication between this application happens between something like dependency injection, okay? Uh, the accounting module can directly call something in the email module and it's just working. It's within the same, since they are things, they are uh, the whole, application, the whole modules reside in one single code base, one single project. It's really, really easy to uh, communicate with each other. And uh, maintenance wise, it's really simple. Uh, why? Uh, all the code related to the application, it, it, it can be in one single project or multiple, um, multiple project, but within a single code base, anyone, uh, anyone can navigate between these projects. So we can see the interaction directly. Uh, okay, the accounting module directly call with the 
email or SMS module, that kind of things is simply visible to us. And the next thing is uh, the uh, pros of this architecture is really easy to understand. Anyone who is coming uh, as a uh, noise or um, someone who is new to application development uh, probably will come across uh, these kind of application architectures and they will probably use that. It's dead simple to understand this kind of thing. Of course, you need the knowledge where you where you need to know about the framework of choice that is used in the backend, the database uh, database uh, calls and everything. Yes, those things will be uh, a must. But when you look at the source code and the code base, the accounting module uh, interaction with the um, SMS module, it's that simple. It's um, uh, the communication happen uh, without an issue. So uh, from understanding, if someone is new, uh, the, uh, the mental mental behavior, the mental picture for the whole application, it, it can be um, easily understandable. Okay, the mental picture for the whole application. Remember the term whole application. Okay, and uh, we can see visible layers of the application. Uh, that that that, uh, that by say. Um, we can see the accounting module. Um, probably uh, when we are developing even the API application, uh, this section right over here. Um, these sections will have uh, another architecture called the uh, tiered architecture. Okay, so if you if you're talking about something like a REST API, we will have something called a control layer and we will have something like a service layer and we will definitely have a repository layer. So each and every layer within the backend itself is really visible uh, for us. So we can uh, clearly see what we are dealing with. Okay. So we will look into a, a simple example of a monolithic application. So you guys will get an idea of what we are talking in here. But in code wise, uh, it's really easy to understand the custom interaction, the browser interaction is handled by something called the control layer. The database uh, interaction is handled by something similar uh, to a repository layer. The logic behind it, the logic, uh, the connecting between these two will be handled by something like a service layer. Okay. The NT architecture uh, help us uh, to divide these layers and interact with each other in different ways. So, the visible layers, visible layers within the backend, within the application will help uh, a lot when we are working with the front end or when we are working with the database. So it's going to be uh, dead spread, uh, which are which, and it's, it's easy to understand. And uh, simple technology stack, of course, uh, when we are working with this kind of application structure, we have uh, pretty much a pretty simple stack. The database is um, there. Uh, it's going to be something like a MongoDB, whatever we like. And there, there, there will be something like um, a repository, a repository, something, uh, a repository, something like um, um, the back, uh, the connection between that. So in here, there is no like um, special uh, technology in here, but most of the time the backend will provide a repository access layer. We call the database connection or database execution layer. So we uh, have something like that. Then we have a simple uh, uh, front end. Uh, we will be something like a, uh, next, uh, the next React JS or Angular JS, that kind of application. But we are really concerning in here, the simple uh, technology stack it's going to be in the database side. So uh, probably the stack will contain, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, the simple stack will contain something like uh, a database connection. Okay, that is one thing that we will need. And we will need something like um, uh, a framework, a simple framework of your choice. Most of the time, uh, people now develop in uh, uh, Spring uh, Java based application, Node.js application, Python based application. So, whatever you like, you can have an uh, application of uh, framework of your choice to work with. So, 
that is another thing that you can work with. Um, and there is uh, pretty much it. Okay, you will have a database, you will have uh, a simple programming language or framework, and you can um, you can put data and you can get back data and you can manipulate and send it back to the server. So there is no puzzle around here. You will have very simple things, uh, very um, basic uh, uh, things uh, to worry about. And the next thing is uh, simple operation stack. That means uh, once we um, uh, once we uh, uh, once we think about the operation, um, so we when we are de deploying these things, um, when we are deploying the application, it's going to be a very simple uh, task. Okay, so we 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 will have we need a database. We need a place to host our uh, application, and we will have an API to work with. Okay, um, when we are operating these things, whenever we want to, uh, whenever we want to work with the, uh, when we want to de deploy this application, uh, it's gonna be that simple. Um, uh, we will we will have these things in uh, um, in a simple server. Probably you guys have uh, heard uh, shared hosting, that kind of thing. So you will have a, a hosting solution out of there, and you can you will get a database. You will have the uh, you will have a place to store your application. That's it. So if if you take something more advanced like uh, a VM based application, so you will get a uh, a machine in the cloud like uh, AWS um, EC2 instance or AWS Lifescale or GCP VM, whatever the VM virtual uh, machine that you will get, uh, you you can run your application. Sometimes you will you might be able to run a database and your application in the same machine, and it's it's that simple that you can deploy uh, this application, and that's the only thing that you need to worry about. So uh, the operation stack uh, is going to be pretty simple as same as the technology stack. Um, so uh, any application that we are developing, uh, you can see easily we can understand these uh, things and it's easy, e e um, the computational wise, it's easy. Uh, let's talk about the cons in here. The cons in here is the one well, first thing is the coupling. The tightly coupled, so you guys can see when um, when these uh, modules are developed, these modules are developed. Probably uh, we'll be uh, having connection between these two. So accounting modules want uh, to do some email sending. The accounting module will have a, definitely have a coupling or, or dependency on the email module. So inventory module sometimes they will have a dependency on. Uh, what we call um, uh, uh, the inventory module sometimes will have a, a direction with uh, the shipping module and the shipping module may have a connection with email module and sometimes when you look at the connection between these modules when you look at the connection between these uh, separate sections it's going to be something a complex one okay uh, we can't clearly see the boundaries of each other and sometimes the uh, the if you if you try to uh, visualize the uh, uh, connection between uh, each and every um, section of these modules, it's gonna be a little bit messy. We call that as a spaghetti. So the connections are here and there. It's going. Uh, we can't clearly see the boundaries and everything. So the coupling happens uh, at a at a later stage. We'll definitely affect um, the couple uh, the uh, uh, the uh, applications structure okay so accounting module will have something with the email and the email module will have some dependency on it in each other so they are tightly coupled for some reason let's say for some reason um, we we got an error uh, with the inventory module uh, based on that, uh, all the other modules may not work, okay, depending on the 
uh, coupling okay that i'm not saying it's going to be always the thing but depending on the coupling if the coupling is um, if if uh, everything is so solely depending on something like this uh, the whole application can break very easily and in large application hard to understand the context okay so um, the main uh, main issue with that it's going to be something in the uh, easy to understand to hard to understand it's going to be based on the situation that we are in so if it is a simple application we can see the few modules and everything yes it's easy to understand most of the time uh, the connections and everything we can uh, literally see those things but when the application grows, when the application is um, getting larger and larger, let's say we have hundreds of modules, then the problem arises. Uh, we can't get the whole understanding. We can't get the whole context in one picture. Uh, for someone uh, who is new to the team, get we very easily can get overwhelmed. The reason behind that is the uh, application uh, understanding of the context. What uh, what does the accounting module does? What the inventory modules does? Even with the modules, with the simple modules, there can be hundreds of functions that they are performing. There can be hundreds of um, things, uh, terms that shipping uses. So we we we, uh, we need to understand all those things. Sometimes uh, the same name uh, have different meaning based on the um, based on the uh, module that we are uh, talking about. Some terms are there, which is uh, in inventory module, it means something, but in accounting module, if you have that same term, it's going to be a completely different thing. So. Uh, we need to have a memory. Ah, okay, when we are working with inventory module, this uh, when we when we talk about uh, uh, when we talk about X, the inventory X is something. When we talk about the same X in accounting module, that is a different meaning or some uh, the X uh, behave differently on the accounting module. So we need to have a clear um, memory map. Uh, on these applications so when the application grows when I mean, the application is really huge it's hard to someone to uh, retain all those things within memory it's, it's not going to be really easy task to do so that's kind of thing is going to be uh, really hard when the application is so huge okay and the next thing is the uh, scalability and performance issues. So that is the main um, issue that we will be uh, facing with the monolithic application, the bottlenecks, the performance issues, the scalability issues. So for some reason, um, we we are going, uh, we have developed our application and it works perfectly. And, um, uh, our application is so good. Now there are like thousands of people are uh, accessing our uh, our website. And as you guys know, uh, when when there is more traffic, when there are more users involved with the system, the system will get overwhelmed very quickly. Why? We need to cater. Uh, we can cater like uh, ten people uh, per second. But what if it it is reaching out? Um, 100 users, what if it is using 1000 users? So we need to think about the scalability. The service that we are running has certain limitations, uh, certain uh, memory restrictions. We, we don't have like uh, unlimited memory that uh, that a server can handle and everything will go, go smoothly. So, um, when the traffic grows, the database uh, might be uh, bottlenecked out of this. The server will have a hard time understanding all those things. So it's going to create a fast, uh, it's going to create a little bit of uh, issue, a little bit of um, uh, what do you call a uh, little bit of um, performance. Uh, performance issues that we can't cater these things, but there are certain uh, uh, certain mechanisms that we can do in order to get rid of that 
uh, perhaps you guys have heard uh, the term uh, something like load balancing so what we can do is we can make clone of this okay we we take the application the application layer and we make a clone of this and we will have something uh, something uh, in the front what we call a load balancer whenever a request come first it goes to the load balancer then load balancer will uh, have two instances of this application okay two or more that's depending on how how much you want to scale there can be two instances and the load balancer will send either one of these things uh, rather than sending directly to one the load balancer will send uh, the request to two uh, two instances so when we are sending like that the server load can be um, distributed among two computers okay two servers uh, but then again the problem arises with the database how are we going to uh, are we going to scale the database because let's say for example uh, we we have uh, a load balancer we have a server and the load balancer is sending some data uh, to save and if if they have a database uh, for that what will happen is uh, the data will be saved in uh, the instance a and the next time when we want to retrieve that when we want to retrieve that what will happen it will go to the uh, second instance of this and it will try to connect to its database since the first instance for the first request went to the first server and the second instance is looking from the second server the data will be lost we we, we can't we can't we, the uh, application will respond there is no such a data the reason behind that we have a load balancer and we have two different databases and different applications so it's not going to work so uh, in order to uh, in order to solve those things we have uh, something called sticky sessions okay so whenever a user is uh, working with this server the load balancer always send uh, the request to one particular one particular service and uh, another customer comes uh, or another request come it will be sent to a particular server so we can have sticky session to manage them but even though uh, the database uh, uh, the database won't be synced up okay so next time the, when the session expired what will happen is uh, the user will be requesting from something else so in, in terms of having a load balancer will uh, will will have some effects but it will uh, not be not going to be the 100% or the uh, fulfillment of solution it, it it has its own uh, advantages and disadvantages having a load balancer in front and some of the most common patterns that you will see uh, with the database is that okay if the database is the problem we will have two instances okay we have two uh, application servers and one single database the both of these uh, applications will be uh, working with a one single database okay so there are going to be two instances of the application two instances and both of these application will be working with the single database so whenever a request come uh, it will update the database if uh, the next time it is requesting uh, since it is the same database we will have the data back with us the problem arises again at uh, the database okay now the database is handling uh, so much uh, so much thing uh, so two applications are concurrently using the database the database will be a bottleneck okay so database will get probably get overwhelmed pretty soon okay so pretty soon we the database will get overwhelmed by so many requests happening within the two different applications we have the load balancer we have two applications and the both of those application will be handling the will be calling the same database so that will uh, overwhelm the database okay a single database so what will happen uh, what will happen in the database is um, we will we'll be getting uh, so much uh, issue or so much uh, so much um, traffic the database will probably get down that means the probability uh, database will overwhelm and it will be shut down the whole application will collapse in that scenario so we want we don't need that we need the database up and running and 
um, we need uh, we need everything to work as expected. So what else we can do? So if the bottleneck is database, the bottleneck is if it is the database, we have some options. Uh, what we call a cluster. Okay, it's one of the other uh, uh, one of our um, uh, main uh, discussion area. We we'll look into how we can create a database cluster. So there won't be one single database, but it will be a um, it will be a, a collection of databases. Okay, uh, same type. I mean, if you are using one single database type, the database will have several copies, and all those copies, the database copies, will have something called a master that will handle everything. And whenever a request comes, the database will uh, divide among the divide among the uh, uh, master and slaves. We call the things as um, uh, nowadays we don't use the term master and slaves. We use the term uh, master and nodes. Okay, so we we have one single master node master database, and we have several nodes. The several nodes will be communicating each other and um, they will have the synchronized data. That means whenever one single database gets updated, all the others will have the same information. And whenever we are doing a request, it's not always going to be the master database will be accessing. We can have a database cluster. Either one of those databases will respond to us. Okay, But uh, from the looking at outside, looking in the outside, we will see only one single database in action. Okay, we don't see, okay, we have three databases. We don't need to interact with three. The clustering that happens within the database will be handled uh, automatically for us. So that's, that is uh, some, um, uh, some solutions that uh, the problem of scaling that we can provide. So we talked about the load balancing. We talk about database um, uh, database clustering. We talked about uh, scaling up the application, uh, scaling up the server. So those are like the solutions uh, when we come when we when we uh, want to uh, work with the application when we want to scale it up when we want to increase performance. That sort of things we can work, uh, but. Um, even with that, it's not going to be enough on some occasions. We'll see why. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes we, 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 see, uh, uh, we see the server. Um, uh, the servers have two, way, two ways of scaling. We call the horizontal scaling and vertical scaling. Okay. So we have the horizontal scaling. The horizontal scaling, what we will do is uh, we will increase the uh, resources available within this uh, server. So say for example, this machine has two GB RAM and one CPU. So with the horizontal scaling, we will say, okay, uh, if the memory and the CPU is a problem, what we will do is we will increase the memory. Uh, we will increase it up to, let's say, um, four GB and two CPUs, okay? So we will, we will, uh, we will do the scaling within the resource itself. So we call that horizontal scaling. And the next thing uh, earlier we discussed, if you use a load balancer and use two instance, uh, so what we call is that is a vertical uh, vertical scaling. So we, we, we do not scale up the resources within the application, but we clone these uh, resources and have a load balancer of the connection between them. So either we can horizontally scale this or vertically scale the application. So uh, even with that, we have certain limitations. We have certain limitations, right? Uh, the, uh, the application itself uh, is uh, replicating itself with uh, some minor uh, issues. Let's see uh, what are those issues when we are talking in microservices. Um, what monolithic is failing behind, what monolithic can do up to a certain limit, and how microservice is um, resolving these uh, problems, how mono uh, microservice can 
um, think in terms of scaling and uh, distributing these frameworks. So uh, get an idea on monolithic application, its limitation, and how we can overcome, especially with the load balancer, horizontal and vertical scaling, and clustering. So those kind of things, using those, um, those techniques, we can uh, have some sort of um, scalability, some sort of performance improvement, but it's not going to be enough on uh, some application. We are talking in here. Uh, a request that is coming for a server, like within a millisecond, we will get uh, millions of uh, requests. Okay, uh, within within a second, we will get millions of requests. And we are talking in that level. So even in, in in such a such a scenario, we would probably not be able to do a monolithic application and scale our things uh, to work in that level. So. Let's see uh, what are what is the answer. What what sort of thing uh, the uh, microservice architecture will be helping us. So basically, in microservice architecture, we will have different um, different scaling mechanisms. So rather than uh, you guys can see, we we have all these um, services or modules within one single server but in <clears throat> within a microservice application we would have separate servers or separate instances for each and every module that we have okay and probably you would uh, probably most of the time what we get wrong uh, in the microservice architecture is uh, microservice per module that is not something uh, happening okay that is um, that is uh, a wrong practice that we are doing uh, there are uh, there are techniques that we need to think uh, in order to do the microservice uh, what do you call uh, microservice uh, service differentiation and it is not by uh, it is not something happens based on the uh, module that we are working with. That is not the case. Uh, I'm not gonna go into, uh, I'm not gonna go into the uh, design or implementation pattern uh, of how we can, uh, how we can, um, how we can turn a monolithic application into a microservice application, but for the uh, simple purpose or simple ex explanation, we would think uh, all the modules have different services, uh, microservices. So we think the account module is a small service. Hence the uh, term comes microservice, very small services. Um, we call those things uh, milli or micro. So we have microservices in here. So rather than uh, we we are having all the modules within one single server, one single instance, we have a um, separate instance uh, for the functionalities or the services that we are providing. So how this can be uh, a game changer, how this can uh, affect the performance, how this um, will be uh, uh, providing a good solution on this. So let's see uh, what are the things microservice will be providing and what sort of um, what sort of um, advantages when it is coming to performance and scaling that it, it's try to resolve. Okay, um, so first um, uh, you guys can see something in, uh, in the uh, browser itself. So this is not a load balancer. Don't get confused with the load balancer in, 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 in front of the uh, monolithic application. What we are talking in here, the API gateway, okay? So API gateway is a piece of software, again, a piece of software that will act as, uh, uh, act, that will act as, um, uh, that will act as, uh, um, what do you call uh, 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 
sorry. Uh, the my, uh, API gateway act as something what we call uh, aggregator. That means uh, whenever we want to, uh, whenever we want to uh, communicate with, um, uh, sorry, where is okay. So whenever we want to communicate the accounting module and inventory module, probably the API gateway will have a route between these two. So the service itself, services itself can communicate with each other. But when it is coming to the browser, when it is coming to the client, the client won't be able to access, ah, okay, I want to make a call to inventory, inventory module. I want to call make, I want to make a call for the accounting module. So we can't have separate gateways for these things. So we can't have a separate call, separate server call for accounting, separate call for inventory, so on and so forth. So what we will come across is what we call an API gateway that uh, aggregate all these things. It combine all these things and the client will no longer knows. Okay, we are talking to the inventory module. We are talking to the accounting module. The API gateway will aggregate everything. And depending on the request, depending on the use case, it will uh, redirect all the things either to accounting module or inventory module or shipping module. So in this way, the API gateway handle uh, act as uh, act as uh, uh, something like a router. Whenever a request comes in, it goes for the um, appropriate uh, module uh, to give the details or get uh, update the details. So in contrast of a monolithic application, you guys can see everything in here. It's within the same reside in the same application. So what we have all what we have done is we have uh, decomposed this application and put it in several several places. Okay. So how this is gonna save? Uh, this is gonna um, mm, this is gonna solve the problem of microservices. So we are how 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 it's uh, gonna help us? So we are spinning up. Uh, more servers uh, earlier than we had only one server now we have four four, four, four different modules so how this is going to help us so uh, when it is coming to scaling side if you guys can remember we had the vertical scaling uh, scenario whenever we want to scale up the monolithic application we can vertically scale that means we can have clone of this application we can have one or many, um, probably two or many uh, instances, and using a load balancer, we can uh, balance the request load. So in that scenario, if you guys can remember, we are vertically, um, we are vertically scaling. That means when we are, when we do vertical scaling, what will happen is we get a clone of this application. So when we clone this application, you guys can see. Since these are in one single code base, one, one single application, the accounting module, image module, shipping module, and email module, all those things will be copied around. Okay. If we have another clone, it will be the same thing. It will have accounting, inventory, shipping, and email. So if we take 10 copies of this, all the 10 copies will have accounting module, image module, and email module. That's a must. Otherwise, they won't work because since these are coupled, uh, how many copies that you take, uh, the application need to have uh, 10 copies of the application and the same since everything is tightly coupled, everything is in one single place, all these modules should reside on one single uh, application, that is for monolithic. But most of the time, when, when, we, when we are working with applications, um, the uh, scaling part, when the scaling part happens, some modules have less responsibilities. Some modules have more responsibilities. In the sense, say for example, um, let's assume the e-commerce uh, section. Okay, uh, so let's take a peak uh, uh, peak time uh, within the year. So most probably when uh, in Sri Lanka, probably uh, when uh, out of season comes. Uh, most of the time in on the nearing the uh, out of the days we get more uh, 
sales done in online. Okay, there can be thousands of uh, requests coming in uh, for shipping, uh, for deliveries, for placing orders and everything. But uh, on also there will be peak on December. Most of the time people do uh, end uh, purchases. So that kind of um, um, that kind of applications, that kind of um, um, things will come along. Okay, the peaks are coming. So when a peak comes, uh, we we should think what are the modules that users will mostly interact. Uh, user will be definitely will be interacting with uh, shipping and emails because that those are like um, core modules. Okay, most of the time, sometimes user will uh, unless they place order. The shipping module won't be necessary. So at the latter part of the application, at the latter part of the uh, transaction, we need the shipping module to be worked with. Uh, sometimes when we are making a uh, making um, uh, placing an order, the accounting module may be uh, in a less use case. The accounting module is there, but for a second that account there is no accounting module involved in the um, uh, placing an order okay uh, the inventory module most of the time will get updated but not uh, not uh, busy as email or sms module so each and every we we don't uh, uh, we don't uh, we can accept that the accounting module inventory modules and the shipping modules and all these modules will have different uh, responsibility, responsibilities within the application as well as different loads. Okay, Not all the time the accounting module will have the uh, huge amount of load. Not all the time the inventory will have. So based on the situation, based on the, uh, based on the uh, uh, availability, based on the priority, based on um, what users are mostly interacting, these modules will have different um, uh, different priorities, different workloads. But when we are when we when we want to uh, scale up a monolithic application, we need to scale up everything. That means even though let's say we, we want to scale up the accounting module, uh, we need um, we have a lot of uh, traffic coming to the accounting module. Now we want to scale up the accounting module, but since the monolithic is bulked into one, we can't say, okay, we will be, well, since the accounting module is too much, we can't say, okay, we will scale up accounting module only because since these are tightly coupled, every other services will be scaled along. So if we spin up another one, if you want two accounting modules, uh, unfortunately, we will get two accounting modules as well as two inventory modules, CP modules, and two email modules. So it's going to be most of the time based of um, this of based of resources because uh, the inventory module is not getting that much amount of uh, traffic. But anyhow, since the accounting module needs uh, to be scaled, we need to we need to have um, uh, either we like it or not the inventory module as well. You might say, okay, let's remove the inventory module and have something like that. But then again, a problem comes in. Um, since these uh, these things are tightly coupled, we can't just simply remove the inventory module and uh, deploy the accounting module. That is not possible most of the time in a monolithic application. We can't just say, uh, okay, we will just remove inventory module and uh, go forward. That is not an option in there. So. In the monolithic application, the resource get wasted whenever we are scaling up. All the services are getting uh, scaled up. All the services are getting uh, jumped in, whether we like or not, whether we want it or not. All those things will go up, and we will be uh, we will have the uh, working module. Say accounting modules should be the one uh, with more with more traffic in hand. It will be scaled up. Other things will get automatically scaled. Automatically will be scaled up, but they are in not in use. 
Okay, so we are re we are wasting resources while we are uh, gaining uh, some um, traction to this module. Okay, so uh, that is that is what we call an issue with the uh, monolithic application. We can't uh, vertically scale only one service. But when, when it is microservice, it's the opposite. So since these uh, applications, they 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 um they act upon uh, the, the the services the modules that we have, uh, they are acting in a uh, isolated way, isolated manner. So these services will uh, have different. Uh, what you call uh, instances. So let's say, for instance, uh, now um, we are getting more traction for our accounting module. Since this is a microservice, we can simply have two or more accounting modules within our application. So we can vertically scale only the accounting module. So uh, we, we can have 10 accounting modules while we have only one inventory module. Okay, because the traction, the uh, the application where we want to work with the most of the uh, pe most of the people are coming to the accounting module. So we can scale the accounting module alone without scaling other modules. Okay, so when the traction goes in, it goes out. That means whenever we can we we can say ah the accounting module is getting traction uh, when it is uh, let's say. Uh, when uh, the payments, uh, when when we are creating the salary, or at the end of the day, uh, we can we can anticipate the traffic at a certain peak. Uh, the accounting module is getting peak, so at that time, what we will do is we will create more accounting modules, and all the account, uh, all the extra traffic that is coming to the accounting module. It will have a clone only for accounting module, and let's say the account module have ten uh, instances. All those ten instances will handle the accounting module, uh, and it will work uh, as one. So when the traction goes down, when the uh, application do not need that much of uh, uh, when the application do not need that much of traction for the accounting module, it can scale back to one single accounting module. So whenever we whenever we want, we can simply uh, vertically scale a single service, a microservice, a single microservice can be vertically scaled. And when the traction goes down, we can scale down. Same goes to other ones as well. If you want, uh, for some reason, for uh, some task, the inventory module is getting so busy. Let's say, for instance, uh, when new shipments are coming, the inventory module is getting so busy. So at that time, you don't need the accounting module to scale uh, along with that. So what we'll do is we only scale up the inventory module. Once the inventory module is done, uh, the, scale, the hype is gone, the, everything is processed now we can go back to uh, one inventory module so you can see without cloning all the other resources without uh, without um, uh, without scaling up uh, all the other instances we can scale up one single microservice okay with the one single microservice we can uh, scale that up and it will work so that is one thing, uh, how the scalability, the vertical scalability is handled in the microservice architecture. Uh, so there are other things um, that it will come. So the accounting module uh, will have what we call a repository. Okay, and you guys can see since these are each an individual applications, each are like separate application. Uh, we will have a completely new database, a separate database for each module. And uh, since the accounting module is interacting with database X, 
the accounting module will have more control to uh, more uh, interaction with database X. The inventory module will have uh, uh, database Y and goes to database Z as well. So one thing to remember in here, the X, Y, Z, um, uh, we are not indicating, we are indicating a different um, thing in here as well. Let me explain what. So um, let's see the pros and cons. And while we are working on that, while we are, we are, while we are discussing, we will see why these X, Y, Z are important. So the pros, uh, first thing is, yes, decoupled. You guys can see the accounting module uh, and the inventory modules are now two different modules. Uh, so whenever we they want to do something, whenever they want to share some information, the information should be handled um, uh, communicating between the accounting module and the inventory module. It's like two uh, services, two uh, individual applications are talking to each other. Okay, so rather than having everything in one and coupled architecture, now if you want something to happen in the accounting module, the inventory module call this, and once it is done, the accounting module will get back to the inventory module. So these applications, these uh, this call happening between these uh, two modules are now decoupled. The accounting module does not uh, heavily rely on the inventory module unless we have to get something done. So the coupling, uh, decoupling will help us a lot in that manner. The next thing that we need to uh, uh, we need to see that it is scalable. As I mentioned earlier, we can individually scale these services uh, rather than scaling uh, vertically. Uh, sorry, uh, rather than, uh, of course, we can do horizontal scaling as well. If the accounting module needs one single uh, informant, uh, in, uh, uh, um, the the server specs if you want to upgrade yes we can do that but if you want to do a vertical scaling if you want to vertically scale something you can do that as well in here simply scale up the service and scale it down uh, when the key, key, uh, when the traction goes down and the uh, next thing is easy to understand the context okay so whenever we are developing a microservice application, the uh, the traditional or the best practices when we are working with a uh, more uh, microservice application is that the accounting module will be handled by a separate team. Okay, so uh, the expert on uh, accounting module. So let's say uh, we have a domain expert in accounting. We have one single person or maybe two, one single resources, resources in accounting and two developers and two QAs who will be working with the accounting module only. Okay. So whenever a new developer comes in or whenever a new teammates comes in, we do not need to worry about uh, giving them the all the information um, all the information about other modules because these are decoupled now. So the inventory module is decoupled. Uh, inventory module is decoupled. Accounting module, you don't, uh, the people who are working with the accounting module do not need to know anything about the inventory module. If they need to communicate with that, all you have to do, okay, um, there is something that we need to get done by the inventory module. We just call it and get it done. Okay, that's it. The accounting module, uh, the people who are uh, handling the accounting module should not know or they do not need a better understanding of the inventory module itself. How inventory module is handling that section, they, they don't need that. They have the abstraction layer. So uh, let's say, for example, uh, we need we need to uh, check the uh, existing inventory. Okay, we need to check. Uh, we give a product, and uh, we call the inventory module. I want to know uh, how much inventory with within this certain product. So the accounting module will just give 
the product name. Okay, I need uh, the uh, the product name will be given to the inventory module. So the inventory module knows. Ah, okay, this person is asking how much how much uh, uh, inventory is on this certain product. It simply will go back and forth. Let's say the inventory module should uh, look in uh, the storehouse on the way and uh, in the retailers everywhere it needs to look in. They will look and get the summation. Okay, there are five in stock. Uh, there are five in retailers and six on the way and seven in the storehouse. They will do the calculation. Uh, they will calculate everything that they need and the accounting, uh, it will send back uh, the details for the accounting module. So the accounting module does not need to know where to look the uh, inventory and everything. Inventory modules know, ah, okay, if somebody is asking for the, uh, if somebody is asking for the inventory, we need to look into these six or seven places and we need to report it back. So the inventory module uh, has the abstraction layer of it, the accounting module, uh, can just simply call it and take the value. So anyone who is working at the accounting module, okay, they do not need the information about how the inventory module is working there. So the abstraction provided, the abstraction provided by these layers uh, will help the people who are working in working with accounting to just to focus on accounting only. So they don't need any information about the inventory, how the how those things are handled. They just say, okay, we need to get the inventory and it will give that. So you guys can see the accounting modules works get less. Okay, they need only to focus on uh, accounting things. If they need something certain about the inventory, they just call this and get detail back. So whenever we are working with the Microsoft architecture, uh, the uh, the context we call this ubiquitous context. The context of this application, uh, whenever we people who are looking into this, they don't need uh, the context of other services. So they can primarily focus on what they are learning. Okay, so it will uh, it will give certain advantages and disadvantages. The advantages is, okay, I don't need to know about the whole application. What I am doing is enough and most probably it will uh, sufficient for the application as well. So whatever whatever I want to do, I can do with the county modules. That's it. Uh, the, they do not need to have the whole picture of the application. They just have abstraction layers on all these uh, things. They need to just call it and work with it. So the people who are working in the accounting module are best at what they are doing. They know the uh, accounting module from zero to hundred. So uh, there is the um, there is the advantage. So they don't need to worry about all the system operations and everything. They will be primarily focusing on what they have, and they are good at it. So that is what we are talking about, easy to understand the context. So they don't need to know anything else. And the next thing is the polycode data sources. So one thing that you, you can see in this uh, example, as I mentioned earlier, so we have the accounting uh, module accessing the database via a repository. And you guys can see the database in here is X, in here Y, and in here it is Z. It is not representing, it is not representing three different databases, but in here, of course, there can be three different databases, that is for sure, but the type of the database is different. So this is going to be type X, this is going to be type Y, and this is going to be type Z. What do you mean by different data sources, different databases? So when we have different databases, we call, we, we have, we, we come up with the term, we call polygon data sources. That means not only one database type that we are familiar with, not only one single database type that we are interested in. We will have different uh, databases uh, with us, okay? So 
uh, accounting module will have uh, X type, uh, inventory have Y type, and shipment have Z type. So why will be using so many different databases? Why we we can't stick with one single database type? Uh, the reason behind uh, you guys know that earlier on, like when we when at least when I was um, uh, coming to the picture with the application, it was like earlier days, but at least um, the most um, dominant database type was SQL databases. So you guys know MySQL, uh, Postgres, and MSSQL, that's kind of applications were like the dominant of SQL databases. But when times goes, when the applications and the data structures and everything changes, uh, we have different uh, needs. We have different database types. So hence, we got uh, no SQL databases. We had earlier SQL databases. Now we have no SQL databases. So no SQL databases. It's a variety of uh, databases are there. So SQL databases, of course, most probably you guys have heard, where we have um, things like... Um, uh, where we have things like uh, SQL uh, queries, relationship tables, and all those things. But NoSQL databases, they do not follow such a thing. They have uh, different terms, different uh, things, different aspects. For example, uh, we have databases such as MongoDB. MongoDB comes under a NoSQL database and a subcategory called document-based uh, uh, databases. So we, we have MongoDB. The MongoDB is coming under NoSQL databases as well as it is a document-based uh, database. And there, uh, again, we have uh, other uh, databases. Uh, let's take um, a database such as Redis. Perhaps you guys have heard about it. Redis is a key value database. Okay, the key value database is there. So uh, the document database and the key value database, uh, and we have some large uh, number of uh, uh, column-based databases. Uh, there is one example called Cassandra. So Cassandra is a column-based database, Redis is a key value database, and NoSQL and MongoDB is what we call a document database. So we have different databases. So why different databases? Why? What's the main reason? Why can't we put everything in a relationship and work it? No, the modern, um, modern era of data have modern requirements. Okay, not everything that we see today can be fit in uh, SQL databases. Sometimes um, databases such as NoSQL helps us to store unstructured data. Okay, if you are working with SQL data, with SQL databases, we need a structure, we need a schema to store the data within a SQL database. But if, if we use a MongoDB or document oriented database, we don't need a schema, it's schemaless most of the time, what we call. We don't need a schema. We can put um, information without a schema. So, but uh, so certain applications, certain applications will get benefit of all of it. Okay. Say, for instance, uh, accounting module need uh, faster. Uh, accounting module need uh, faster insertions. Okay. The data that we that is coming, we need to. Uh, insert them as much as much uh, faster as possible. So in that scenario, uh, NoSQL database is comparably better than a SQL database when you are talking in inserting databases. So if if the accounting module's primary objective is inserting data, then rather than having a SQL database to do it, we can have a NoSQL database that works better for that job. Okay. So based on the job, based on the requirement, we can have a different database for that job. 
Okay, so that will speed up the things. It will make things easy, and it will uh, it will be uh, uh, the the application will be much faster and reliable to others. And there are uh, key value databases like uh, such as Redis. The Redis databases. Uh, if you want to uh, get something very fast, okay. If you want to something for caching and uh, pubs up all kind of things. So Redis provide that kind of database support. Okay, so inventory module need the uh, caching mechanism to implement it. Of course, uh, Redis is one of the option rather than depending on the SQL database. So that kind of uh, flexibility, that kind of uh, implementation is possible uh, when we are talking about uh, polygon data sources. And the next thing, uh, uh, say for example, in modern era, like let's say, Let's take the example of social medias and everything. You guys can see it's going to be a massive data. Okay. Think about the social network like Facebook. Okay. They have almost every uh, information that we can literally put on. If you, if you need information about yourself uh, in 2017, of course, you can go there and get it back. Think about how many users are there. There's going to be millions of users. Who is using the Facebook? And out of those million users, I can get my information, uh, only my information within uh, last years or also. Okay. So think about the data points that we have already created. Okay. I am not uh, like a, a huge uh, content creator when it is coming to social media, but I have seen a lot of people who have like. Two or three posts per day, this kind of interaction. They like some post, they share some post. So think about the data, the enormous number of data that we are generating. Do you think that a SQL database fulfill this requirement? They they can they can do uh, these kind of uh, data management using a SQL database. I don't think so. So they have a special database which we can um, which we can interact with which we can um, which we can manage millions of data by simply using a column based database such as cassandra so initially i think cassandra is from facebook as well so they know the space so they uh, they have optimized so working with that so if you if you have uh, such a thing such uh, such a requirement say for example the email and sms module is generating more data uh, that we can handle we can completely put those things in uh, such a uh, we can put those things in such a repository uh, such a database sorry so you guys can see uh, when we are using polygon data sources we can create different use cases. We can uh, have different use cases and those different use cases will have different functionalities and those different functionalities, what, uh, what they will do is they will be optimized for that, okay? So earlier on in a microservice, sorry, on a monolithic application, probably we will be stuck into one single database, of course, uh, it is not limiting for one single database. We can have multiple databases. But then again, think how when we are scaling this up, uh, how much uh, trouble that we are in when we are connecting to these things. Okay, But in, in a scenario like a mono microservice application, we can have different database types for different modules. And they will interact with each other they don't need to know what database uh, inventory module is using. They don't need to know what shipping module is using. Just we will interact with these each other and it, it, it will provide the information that we need. So it's as simple as that. So uh, using Polygon data sources, we can have more information. Uh, we, can, we can take uh, more leverage on uh, different database type, different operation, and so on and so forth. So it's a good thing. Um, we can use uh, different database types on different models. So that is uh, something what we call um, the polygon data sources. 
and uh, the next thing is better organized uh, that in the sense you guys can see clearly these are bounded the accounting module is bounded with the um, tech stack whatever the use case that we are using and by the way another thing that you that you might have think that is the accounting module the accounting module uh, is using let's say we are using java okay and we are using mongodb in here so it is not uh, it is not limited to use java on every each and every application what we can do we can we can use a python uh, framework for our other inventory based application. We can use Node.js for our shipping modules. So based on the knowledge of the application, uh, based on the uh, team's capabilities, based on the requirement, we can use even different uh, programming languages in here to fulfill our needs. So that is also something that we need to think. Polygon databases, Polygon frameworks, and uh, as long as they agree upon uh, uh, they agree upon communicating with each other in a what do you call in a um, uh, um, they call upon each other in a standard way that is fine uh, it doesn't matter the account view module is written in java the inventory module is written in Python or something like that. It doesn't matter as long as they can communicate with each other in a standard way. They are good. They are golden. Okay. So that is one uh, one uh, application. Uh, one one uh, thing that we can do. So the other thing that uh, we can do is the uh, is the distribution of this application. So uh, let's assume uh, the accounting module, okay, the accounting module, as you know, that we have, we are living in a global era. Now we have um, applications or we have, uh, um, we have data centers all over the world. Say for instance, we, we have a data center in Colombo, we have a data center in uh, Japan, we have data center in, uh, uh, USA, or we have data set in Europe. Okay, so the beauty of this application structure is we can have the accounting module in Sri Lanka while the inventory module is in Japan. Okay, it's multi regional based on the use case. Okay, I'm not saying that it, sh it should be something like that. Okay, based on the use case, we can have these modules separated. Uh, separated in different places. Uh, when we when we when we want to use these things, when we when we want to um, um, when we want to uh, uh, interact with these things, okay, that they it doesn't matter where geographically they they are, they can reside anywhere in the world as long as they can communicate. Of course, uh, there are like <coughs> pros and cons. I'm not saying it should be the use case. Okay, we should put everything in um, all around the globe. No, that is not the case. But I'm simply stating that it can be done. Okay, the main thing that uh, that it uh, uh, it help us with is the um, accessibility. So let's say account uh, accounting happens in Sri Lanka. And since the service is in Sri Lanka, most of the accounting stuff will be get much faster because we don't need to go to server in the USA to get the data things done. If the service is in Sri Lanka, the communication lag and latency will be less and it will be it will work much faster. So same goes to other regions, and that's that is also um, the latency will be uh, will be. Um, uh, will be uh, like what we call uh, will be resolved. So the performance gains we can get. The next thing is backups. Okay, say for example, we have a county module in Sri Lanka, and uh, for some reason, um, there is a use case that we need uh, this another service, another 
instance of the uh, county module uh, to be deployed in Japan. We can do that. Okay, so one service, one microservice is residing in Sri Lanka, another service in Japan, another service in USA, you name it. You can have that. If that flexibility is there, but be careful. It is not as easy as illustrating these things. Okay, it is, it is not like a walk in the park. But uh, depending on your requirement, depending on what's, what you need, you can get it done. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, it is independent from the location. It is independent from uh, you know, from the framework, uh, Polygon data sources. So there are like a lot of pros coming into the microservice era. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so what are the cons on this? So if it is so good, why don't we do everything in microservice? Why why um, the uh, cons are there, and what sort of things uh, that that uh, that uh, it's preventing us from uh, emerging everything from microservice? The main reason. Well, okay. Well, not the main reason. One of the main reasons is operation cost. Okay, so you guys can see that. Um, we are taking two, uh, three or different polygon data sources for VMs and API gateways. So all these things are like the uh, um, like the uh, top of the bottom. Okay, um, these are like illustration that we are doing. But uh, deploying a microservice is not cheap. Okay, uh, the operation cost. The API gateway should run, uh, accounting module should run, each and every module should run, this database should run. All those things need resources. So resources need money to operate. Okay, The operation cost is going to be high on the microservice architecture. So we need to be very careful um, whether we need the microservice architecture or not is up to us to decide based on our use case. Okay. So something to remember, make sure that it is uh, absolutely necessary in order to work, uh, work on such a thing. If we, if we do not need that, most probably, if you can't bear the cost, okay, it is not worth enough. Okay? For some reason, we have this microservice architecture put in on everything, but the customers are coming like once a month, then we are wasting so much money uh so just cater on one single user so we should be able to differentiate the use case okay whether we need this or not whether the uh, operation cost is higher than the value that we are gaining we have to decide that um then uh the other thing is architecture patterns are hard to understand so in here in monolithic application we have very limited number of uh, architectural patterns so we have the NTR architecture for the service and repository pattern for the database. And most of the time, uh, client to server architecture to communicate with each other. But when it is coming to microservice, it's not gonna be simple like that. So API gateway is one pattern and uh, multi uh, polygon data source is another pattern. Service scaling is a different pattern and you name it, it is uh, like, if I'm not mistaken, there is like 26 architectural patterns that only microservice can apply, 26 or more. So uh, the hassle, uh, knowing these all architectures, where to use them, whether we can use it or not, it's going to be overwhelming for uh, some developers. So we need to make sure uh, that we are uh, that we are making a lot of information. We are creating information. Uh, 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 we are creating uh, this architecture is not going to be a simple task. Okay, so uh, it is uh, once uh, once um, I think uh, one of the uh, major uh, framework uh, in Java world, the Spring framework. Um, 
we have uh, certain architectures or developer advocate. One of them is Josh Joshua Long. He is one of the writers in the industry. So one of the talks he said that uh, you need to be yay high to do a microservice. That means if you do not have the capabilities, uh, if you do not have the resources, do not think about even a microservice. Okay. So if you have low budget, uh, very new people, and uh, and very less use uh, user user interaction, don't even think about going to microservice at the beginning. Okay. If your business grows, if your requirement is growing, if you have so many requests to handle and the service are overwhelming all the time, then yes, think about a microservice, but do not think uh, microservice as a starting point because uh, believe me, I have I have seen a lot of people, they take, okay, let's, uh, anyhow we can do in the microservice, we will do this in microservice, blah, blah, blah. At the end, they can't make a, a thing out of it because it is so uh, messed up you can't even use that. So in, in order to make sure that uh, the microservice is uh, what you need, you need to know these architectural patterns, you need to understand everything, whether this is suitable or not. You need to do your own research. You need to do most of the hard work of finding out whether this is suitable or not. So that's kind of information, that kind of architectural pattern, that kind of knowledge is not coming within one day. You need experienced people, you need experienced architectures. You need people who know inside and outside of a developing a microservice architecture. And um, especially uh, developing is something, something that we can bear, uh, especially with the uh, orchestration. How are we going to deploy this in, uh, in the real world? That is, that is another mess. So we need to know how we can deploy this application in um, in a cloud provider. Okay, it's it's a completely different thing. Uh, it's a completely um, new thing that we we should think about. And the next thing that we need to be worrying about is the um, uh, operation cost, maintenance cost, even. Um, a single person who is developing this application, it will take a lot of time to understand uh, the architecture um, and everything. It uh, the money we have to spend is a lot if you are if you are building a microservice. But then again, as I mentioned earlier, you have, you need to be a high. That means you need to be uh, if you are in this level and microservice is at this level. So don't even think about uh, filling the gap with uh, people who are who are like uh, very new to these microservices and technologies and architectures. But it is something that you guys should learn. Okay, you not uh, maybe not to develop a microservice architecture or develop something, but there is this microservice architecture. There is uh, the possibility of developing such application in such a manner. But uh, we, there are certain limitations, there are certain uh, barriers that we need to go through. We should know about those things, uh, at least when we are deciding whether to go or not. Okay, um, so there are like uh, microservice patterns that we should know these things, at least like, um, um, what do you call, um, uh, things that you should know, at least to have a better understanding of a microservice. So there are decomposition patterns, there are integration patterns, there are database patterns, observability patterns, and cross-cutting concern patterns, okay? So when uh, these are like not all the patterns, as I mentioned, there are like 26 patterns uh, that you, you need to know, but for at least for the simplest term of uh, developing a microservice architecture, you should have at least these uh, these patterns learned uh, at, at least to get something out of a microservice. So as you can, as I shared earlier, it is not walk in the park. You should have a huge understanding, huge uh, knowledge on 
each of these patterns and how how do they work and how do they um, support in uh, in in terms of developing a microservice application okay so we will not go through all these patterns okay it's it's out of this course but at least know these pattern exist within the microservice architecture so one day you will uh, if you if you uh, if you're lucky enough to get uh, into a microservice uh, based project then you you should you should know okay we are using the you are, we are using the this database pattern we are using this integration pattern this kind of thing probably you will get a good idea and uh, we will we will uh, talk about this uh, cross cutting concern patterns at least so these are like uh, even uh, whatever the uh, patterns of communication or um, uh, patterns uh, that we are using within the microservice uh, the cross cutting concern pattern is at least uh, visible on each and uh, it, it it will be visible on uh, any of the microservices okay so we'll look into what are the building blocks of cross cutting uh, concern patterns and uh, get to know about things uh, yeah, things that are there so we can uh, get a understanding on those things so first thing that we need to uh, work on is the api gateway okay so if you guys can remember um, uh, within, within, within the application itself within the uh, microservice architecture the first thing that you have seen uh, from the browser to uh, from the client itself not the server directly but the api gateway okay so the api gateway is uh, is something that you will see in, in, in most of the microservice patterns that we'll use, okay? So let's see the definition of our API gateway and where we'll be using that. An API gateway acts as the heart of the API management solutions. The API gateway is usually the single entry point for any system that is allows APIs or microservice to work together and in, to provide a uniform experience for the end user. As I mentioned earlier, you can you guys can see that um, there will be different microservices that is going on um, in different places. Okay, so the information that the uh, uh, the, the services they are not in one single place. They are they are the, the services are in different places. Uh, they are hosted in different regions. Uh, they can be okay. They can be hosted in different regions. They can have multiple uh, uh, cloud vendors, as as I mentioned. Uh, probably I did not mention. Maybe the accounting module can be in one single uh, uh, accounting module. Uh, can be in uh, let's say AWS, one single cloud provider, and the inventory module can be in the GCP. Okay. A Google Cloud provider and the shipping module can be in a simple digital ocean while the email module is uh, shining on uh, Azure. Okay, so these things can be in different regions, different cloud providers, you name it, you can have it anywhere you like, but remember it's not uh, as simple as, as it sounds, but it can be done based on the requirements. So the API gateway act as one single entry point for this. No matter where you uh, where you store your application, where you gonna work with this, the API gateway is knows. Uh, okay, uh, any any uh, any anyone who is accessing this service, anyone who wants uh, to access inventory, uh, I know where API inventory. I know the uh, uh, I know the service. This this can be done. Uh, so it will redirect, it will be route the things um, into the uh, appropriate uh, appropriate service, okay? So the appropriate service will know, uh, okay, these things should be going to that service, that one, uh, another service should go into somewhere else. So these are like the most common um, API gateways that you will see. So Spring Cloud Gateway is one of the most popular within the Java frameworks. And there is Netflix, uh, Netflix Zool, and the second version, there is WSO2 API Manager, 
uh, AWS API Gateway, Kong Gateway, APG. There are like so many uh, implementation of API Gateway. Uh, if you are building your own uh, API management, if you are building your own uh, microservice, probably you will use one of the top most one. These are like service oriented or service bounded. So depending on your requirement, if it is only AWS services that you are looking at, you can use the AWS API gateway. But if you are if you want to go vendor neutral, that means you are not tied to AWS, you can use one of uh, these things like Spring Cloud Gateway, Zool, or WS2 API Manager. So it's up to you, the developer, to use one of these things. So uh, one reminder on this uh, API Gateway and Microsoft Gateway. So uh, probably you guys know Netflix, uh, where you uh, watch all the movies and uh, everything. So Netflix uh, initially came up uh, with the problem of scaling the applications, okay? They have millions of users, millions of uh, videos to be streamed, and uh, it's, it, it, is, uh, it, it need to handle uh, uh, all the requests, payments, you name it, or whatever it needs to operate its business. So Netflix uh, had to come up with um, a way to uh, not to disrupt their service and to scale up uh, as much as possible. So Netflix uh, came up with uh, open source solutions or open source solutions that they have freely given to other people. Uh, we called it the Netflix OSS. Okay. One of the component of Netflix OSS is the Zool. So heavily used on uh, microservice architectures these days sometimes you can use other alternatives but uh, Netflix tool was one of the uh, Netflix OSS one of the uh, tech stack that was early in the game uh, that helped us to build uh, what do you call the um, microservice application so um, Netflix not only a uh, uh, streaming provider, something like that. They have wonderful software uh, when it is coming to uh, open source and uh, cloud related stuff. So uh, once you are done uh, watching your movies, just go to Netflix and uh, search Netflix OSS. Uh, let me see whether I have that with me. Uh, Netflix OSS. Yes, open source uh, software center. So have a look around this Netflix OSS and you will find a lot of uh, tools that you will find uh, um, help with microservice development. So it's, it's going to be a game changer if you are coming into uh, these uh, things. You can see a lot of uh, all these, uh, most of these things are like open source, uh, open source software center. So you can use within these, within the, within your applications as well. Um, probably you will see, yes, there is the Zool, Netflix Zool. Uh, so you guys can see all these links over there. Um, um, there is the documentation, uh, the usage and everything, and uh, a lot of things going on in this project. Each and every project that you will see in here, the links that you will see, most probably those things are uh, related to uh, uh, related to developing microservice most of the time. Okay, so check these things out. Uh, probably we'll have, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of design patterns, okay, to uh, overcome uh, the design patterns to help us with um, certain things. This OSS libraries was born, some of the things, not all the things related to, uh, not all the things related to the application development, but at least uh, some things um, you will need uh, will be helped or will be provided by the solutions that is coming from uh, Netflix. You can see that how Netflix uh, is handling uh, 
they are streaming services and probably they 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 are using these tools internally maybe not the open source one but at least some version of these things so we can have uh, hope that these things uh, work in other uh, other areas as well if you want to have uh, if you want to develop an application in in the context of netflix or something similar to netflix probably you will need these tools and since Netflix have already won uh, on the race of doing uh, such a things, so you guys can see uh, there are a lot of tools developed and they are generous enough to make it open source. So we can freely or uh, at least use them. So some contents, some context. So have a look around these things. Uh, it will be worth uh, to know at least these things exist and what they are trying to resolve. Okay, I'm not asking you to like remember everything. Um, but uh, have a mental note on on the things uh, that we have uh, with Netflix. Okay, a side tour for uh, on Netflix and uh, its tech stack that really helps on microservices. So API Gateway, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is the entry point for application. So remember why why it is used. What is the problem that it is trying to solve? And the next thing that we need to know uh, is the service registry. Okay, uh, it is a database of containing the network location of service instances. A service registry need to be highly available and up to date. So uh, I'll explain why a service registry is important. And these are like the examples uh, of. Uh, uh, service registries available. So there is ETCD, Netflix Eureka, Consul, Apache Zookeeper. So all of these things are examples of service provide, uh, service re uh, registries. So why exactly we need a service registry? What is the uh, problem which is trying to solve? So um, as you guys can see that um, um, as you guys can see that um, we create services, right? In, in, in microservice application, we create services. What are the services that we are creating? Uh, we, we can have uh, multiple instance of, um, sorry, let me go back. So we can, uh, we can create multiple instance of account volumes. We can create multiple instance of any of these uh, service, okay? So uh, how do the API gateway, the API gateway is like the, uh, uh, can, uh, API gateway is like the, uh, what do you call the interaction point for these things? Say for instance, we have three, um, three instance of the inventory module. We have three uh, inventory modules uh, with us. So how do the API gateway knows that there are three and you guys can see since these are three instances, those three instances have three different locations, three different IP addresses. So how the API gateway knows that, okay, there are three instances of uh, inventory module. Uh, I need to call one of those things and get it done. Okay, the, 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 uh, uh, the scaling up and scaling down when it is happening, we need to know what are the services available and how much of these things are available and when they are available, what is their address? What is uh, going to be the address and how are we going to communicate with those things? So in order to fulfill that, we have this um, another service, another supporting service. We call these things as cross-cutting. Uh, as I mentioned, in cross-cutting concern patterns, uh, a service registry, whenever we create a new microservice, whenever a new microservice is uh, yeah, born or instantiated, let's say, whenever a new instance is created, uh, first thing that they, they should do is go and register in the service registry. That means, let's say, for example, I, I created uh, for some reason, uh, not for some reason, uh, for uh, higher demand, I have spin up, I have created uh, accounting service, one accounting service instance. 
There was only one. Since the demand is high, I have created another account service. Now we need to know, we need to know the availability of this newly created accounting service. We need to know whether, okay, we have created one. Now every other services gateway should know. There is another extra API, uh, sorry, there is an extra, uh, another extra um, accounting module available. And we should give some uh, data or we, we should give some load that it can be worked on. So the newly created uh, API gateway, what they, they, what they need to do is they need to go and register. They need to go and register within the API's registry service and they, uh, the new service will say, hey, I am the new account module and I will be residing on this IP address. If somebody comes and give uh, something related with uh, accounting, just let me know, okay? So the service registry is the place, ah, okay, uh, saying, accepting, I'm, I'm, I'm talking metaphorically here, not, that, uh, not in actual way, but uh, something uh, like that. So the service registry will say, ah, okay, uh, uh, I know that you have been registered in here. I will let others know that there is a new uh, accounting module available in this IP address. So they will uh, communicate, they will, when, when they meet, they will communicate to you as well. So that's kind of mental model is there. So uh, service registry, whenever a new, um, new uh, instance is coming, uh, coming up, the service registry will know about it, okay? And whenever a new registry is going away, so for instance, uh, let's say uh, we are getting a signal saying, hey, uh, we don't have much load now. Let's, uh, let's scale down the microservices and we don't need those things anymore. So what we can simply do is we can say, uh, okay, uh, the service provider, uh, uh, the orchestration tool, they'll say, okay, let's kill some uh, services. Once they are shutting down, once the microservice is saying, okay, I don't need to be uh, running anymore. Once they are trying to shut him down, the microservice, uh, the service it will say, hey, I am going away, I am shutting down. Uh, remove me from your database. If somebody is trying to reach me, just say I am done or I am not available. Don't send any uh, anything. Um, anything uh, to me uh, because I will be no longer there. This kind of mental picture I have it, okay, metaphorically. So what will happen in there is uh, the service itself, uh, it, it will, uh, it will uh, uh, remove the registered account service saying, uh, okay, no longer that is there. And the service registry will inform all the other services hey, saying, Okay, the account module that we had earlier now no longer works. Do not send requests to that IP address or something like that. So the service registry, keep a track of every uh, service that is registered among the application, and uh, among the uh, microservice application. And once they are done, the service registry will uh, move on and it won't, it won't have those information no more. So the service registry is one of the major things that we need to uh, uh, have around a microservice. Without the service registry, the microservice is like a dumb enough, uh, not smart enough uh, to know where the applications are and who to call, what are the things available. It's gonna be something like a lost scenario. So the service registry is the place where you know what are the available services and where they reside. Okay, so the API gateway will first and ask, hey, uh, service registry, I, I need uh, a location for a service uh, or a microservice, where can I find a account service? The service registry will say, okay, uh, within my registry, within my database, there are three uh, instances, you can choose one or either of them and proceed with your task. So the service registry is like the simplest term, keeper of all the records on the services available and uh, it will inform the others or the uh, uh, like the API gateway or the other services 
regarding uh, the availability of those applications. So that will be easy. So remember the microservice uh, in the architecture, we introduce something API gateway, okay, to, uh, to um, concatenate all the APIs, the various services into one single entry point. Now we have a service registry to keep a track on uh, what are the services available and the list goes on. Okay, that's what I told you guys earlier on. Not like a monolithic application, a microservice application requires more resources, more things uh, to be handling upon. Okay, we are achieving, we are resolving something. We are, uh, we are, uh, we are going to a place. We, we are scalability is not going to be a big, big problem, but while we are doing that, we are adding more complexity to the architecture. Okay. So bear in mind, uh, the service registry is one of the uh, things that uh, that is needed uh, at least for uh, microservice to work. And um, a, a simple illustration uh, would be like this, the service registry. You guys can see, okay, sorry. Uh, Okay. So in here, you guys can see there's a service registry, the API gateway. API, API gateway knows, ah, okay, this is the um, uh, connection between API gateway and service registry. So whenever a new module comes in, they all go and register in the API service. If a new accounting module comes in, it goes and register in the so it's registry and the API gateway have a communication with the API uh, service registry. So uh, API gateway once a request come, okay, I need to go, uh, I need to have some functionality with an uh, inventory module. Okay, the service registry are okay. There is an inventory module at this IP address, go and get that data or go and interact with that. So API gateway goes to the inventory module get the IP and get it done. They know the address, they know the uh, where the service reside and they can get it done. So as I mentioned earlier, the API gateway knows about the service registry, all the accounts should know about the service registry and everything um, that's related to that. So uh, service uh, registry provides all the information about these things to uh, these guys. So that is like the common pattern of a service registry and uh, what it is trying to achieve. And the next thing that we need to do is the uh, external configuration, okay? So externalizing all the application configuration, including in the database, credential and network location on startup as uh, a service reads the configuration from external service, example, environment variable and ATC. So, what do you, why do we need external configuration? Um, the problem arise, um, uh, something like this. Say for example, um, yeah. Say for example, um, within um, uh, we have um, we have the email service. Okay, we have the email service, and for for for. Uh, for a few minutes, think the email module uh, is uh, ten instances. So sending email is one of the one of the huge tasks that we uh, when that we need to do. So we have ten instances of the email uh, service. So we have ten microservices, uh, ten small services, ten instances of the email and SMS module. Now uh, the problem is right. Uh, let's say. Um, we want to change the sender name, okay? So when we are sending an email, you guys know we have a sender's name. So uh, the earlier the company name was uh, company XY. Now uh, we want to change the email sender's name to XYZ, okay? Uh, it's it's going to be a change that we are doing. Um, when we are sending email, we are changing the 
we are simply changing the uh, sender's name. So we have 10 instances in here. We have 10 instances here. So how are we going to change all? Uh, we, we, we need to say, OK, um, right now we are changing the configuration. We are changing the uh, sender's name into this value. OK? The logical thing that we can do, uh, if, if you are if you are thinking normally, what we we'll, what we need to do is we need to go to uh, SMS module one and change the uh, subject in that. And we have two more others. Uh, we have ten more others. We have to go each and individually change the configuration, change the value, uh, the sending uh, sender's name, x y to x y z. Okay, that's the uh, that is the normal behavior that yes anyone can think of. Anyone can think. Okay, let's uh, change uh, in in that way, and it will work. The problem arises. Uh, it is okay if we have one or two, but uh, more than three, more than five. What will happen if you have thousands? Okay, the email module is so popular. Now we have thousand instances of that. We can't go for thousand, uh, thousand uh, instances and change one single thing. Okay, so what we can do, but we, but we can do in in a scenario like that. So what we will do is uh, when we are developing the e uh, email or SMS module, what uh, we can do is we will externalize the uh, sender's name rather than. Uh, it uh, embedded in the uh, application itself. We have the sender's name in the external configuration server. So whenever we want to send uh, email address or we, we, we want to uh, spin up an email address, the sender's name, sender's name is fetched from the configuration server. So when the email SMS module is uh, spinning up, the emails, uh, the email service is creating a new instance. Now, when it is creating, it need to know the sender's address. Rather than have it in the uh, module itself, we will have that information, piece of information in a server called configuration server. OK? So the configuration server have the sender's name. And uh, uh, when the uh, module is starting up, it goes to the configuration server, say, I need the uh, senders in, in senders information senders name at least give me that and when the configuration server gives that okay I know uh, I know the uh, 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 the this is the senders name uh, and once you spin up use that in order to work with that, uh, work with the value okay so rather than hard coding everything in the uh, module itself, we have a configuration server uh, starting up while starting up the module talk to the configuration server, take all the configuration and spin up. Okay, so the uh, the uh, subject is only one configuration. We can have other configurations such as if you want to uh, if you want to have a password, we can have it in the configuration server, something or similar. If you want to have uh, something like um, the database connection, okay, we can have the, the, all those things in the configuration server. So the beauty of the configuration service is that um, not only on the beginning of the application creation, okay, uh, but uh, say for instance, while it is running, we need to change the configuration. We need to change the um, information. So there are 100 email modules, uh, subservices running around. And while it is running, we want to change for, for, for some reason, we want to change the uh, company name from XY to XYZ. Okay. So while it is running, while the application is running, if we go and edit the configuration server, okay, the configuration. Uh, uh, configuration which reside the email subject or the sub email company name. If we edit that in the configuration server, it will inform all the uh, all the registered uh, 
uh, email modules hey this configuration have changed now the uh, application is uh, application name is no longer xy it's xyz now you have that application name and uh, update your configurations as 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 uh, the changes have happened so not only when the booting time uh, the configuration server will provide the detail but after in the mid of oh, after when we are executing this application after when the execution happens and the application is still running we can say configuration server update this and in notify all the others okay uh, so when we update the configuration related to the email module we can say configuration server update everything update everyone and the configuration server will go and tell okay your configuration has been updated update yourself okay not only within the running application but also uh, new create an application as well as running application will get that information okay sure. so while we are running the application okay while we are running the application we can update any configuration on on each and every uh, service that we have okay so why this is so much important in in this scenario the importance coming from um, importance is coming from the fact uh, the uh, the service that we have we can't shut it down while the operation is happening okay so think uh, think in in a scenario we are think that think it is in scale of netflix okay so uh, while the application is running okay while the uh, service is uh, all the email services are running everything is happening the uh, the application is running in production now all of a sudden if you want to do such a such a thing okay you can't shut down the email service okay things the chaos it will bring all the emails will be blocked all the things will be down it will take only five minutes all the uh, if the old services are down uh, most of the things will happen your customers will lose trust uh, if you are running a stock market related or you have stocks within your application your stocks will go down uh, a minor breakdown will cost you uh, a huge ton of money for you because uh, when users lose the trust okay this application won't run 24 hours they will definitely find something else so in order to retain the customers in order to uh, the application always running we need to make sure the applications always smoothly run even a configuration change we can't have all these uh, services uh, turned down or turn off at the same time the configuration server what it will do is it will it will uh, it will re reload the configurations without shutting down the, all the services once the uh, sms modules and everything is up and running on the fly we can change the configuration and the email modules will know the change without shutting down without restarting without doing uh, any uh, changes within your application you can easily uh, easily uh, change the configuration and application will work so that's kind of mental model do not think okay for five minutes we can turn off the email modules and work no we are not not talking uh, even a single minute that we can uh, turn off this and work it it's going to cost a lot so this kind of architecture will help us to run our availability on our application all the time okay all right uh, so these are like uh, these are like uh, the uh, basic uh, basic things basic um, uh, basic necessities if you if you may if you say uh, basic is necessities to run uh, a simple microservice the most simplest one at least you will need api gateway and configuration server 
sometimes they are depending on your request it might need more okay so um, we we can't uh, think we can't um, have the um, um, uh, we can't have everything um, running up and running everywhere. Um, it's not going to be something simple. Um, a monolithic application. We do not have anything like API gateway, service registry, configuration. So no, no, nothing. We just have the um, application. We have database and can work. So the contrast to that, uh, the uh, microservice architecture will have a lot of things uh, to fine tune. And it's easy to say, okay, even for me, I can say, ah, okay, we will have a service registry, and we will have a configuration server. It's and when we are incrementing these things, it's not gonna magically connect to each other. A lot of configurations to the lot of testing need to be happens. So unless you know what you are doing, unless you know what uh, what what sort of application that you are building, it is highly unlikely you will uh, find microservice architecture by day to day okay make sure you understand the concepts make sure you know uh, what what you are getting into and work with uh, the work with the architecture okay so uh, um, next thing that we'll be uh, doing is we will be creating a cluster so in order to create a cluster we'll be um, using a uh, Actually, we, we do not need uh, Docker in this scenario to work it, but it is a nice tool that you guys should, uh, it is something that um, that most of the uh, application developers, if you know Docker, that would be something great. Anyone have a uh, prior experience with Docker? Raise your hand, please. I have worked with Docker in, uh, while I was working. Okay. Anyone knows? Uh, anyone knows what Docker is? What it is trying to resolve? Okay. So what we'll do is we will learn um, some basic Docker commands uh, and um, how orchestration works. Uh, we'll take it in uh, next day. So you guys know basic Docker commands, and uh, we'll set up a cluster and uh, use that cluster to show what this clustering is all about and why it is so important in uh, in uh, application developments okay uh, so probably i will take another session on docker and work with that and um, uh, another thing is container and the next thing is container orchestration we will uh, we will first we will see how containers work and we will go to con con container orchestration on next and probably you don't need to know everything but uh, when we are talking about distributed uh, computing when we are talking about um, cluster computing these are like the default norms these days uh, so better you guys know how these um, distributed computers are working uh, in real life so we'll we'll have a good idea okay uh, when we are distributing an application what are the uh, what are the tools that we are using and how we are managing okay so uh, tools will be docker and how we're going to uh, manage those things will be these orchestration tools okay and um, so uh, Let's keep uh, Docker related things for later session. Um, um, let's see. Uh, uh, let's get the summarization of the presentation. So, why can't we do the microservice everywhere? So it is as you as 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 we can see, it's all a lot of problems. Why we can't use this? Okay. Um, the problem is, as as I mentioned earlier, it is a huge learning curve. Okay, so if you are new to microservices, if you don't know, you know the theories. Okay, you know the theories. Ah, okay, we need uh, API gateway, we need a configuration server, 
okay, let's create our next project on uh, using microservice. Don't ever think about doing that. Okay, you you need uh, you need huge amount of experience when you are working in such application. We are not talking about uh, application that will uh, serve ten people or twenty people. We are talking in here millions. Okay, so in in, in a scenario like that. Uh, to handle those things, we can use microservices. Okay, so uh, try some examples. Uh, try uh, uh, try to create uh, a simple microservice application. Then move on. Okay, um, so we need to know the patterns. As I mentioned earlier, there are like decomposition pattern, integration patterns, cross cutting in, in uh, cross cutting patterns. Uh, API gateway patterns, um, uh, safe, uh, fail safety, uh, retries, you name it, you will have a lot of things to think about. Okay. And the next thing is, as I mentioned, you might be a, a excellent, uh, excellent microservice guru, but understand your team capacity. Probably you uh, within your lifetime. I don't, I don't uh, expect one single person to create a microservice. It's going to be a team effort. Okay, so you need to know the team, team and its capacity when you are working uh, on a such a project. And the most ex uh, most uh, most important thing: understand your client requirement. Okay, the client might be hyped up. Okay, let's do this in microservice. Uh, all the others are doing microservice. We need to do the microservice as well. Let's create that. And when the requirement comes, uh, it's all about 10 or 20 people visiting the website. Okay, you don't need a microservice on that. So, um, client might be hyped around. People might be hyped around. Don't go jump in the hype train unless you know what you are doing or not, but you're committing to it. You should understand it first, then work on it. So as I mentioned earlier, everything has flaws, everything has pros, everything has cons. So silver, uh, microservice is not a silver bullet that will cure everything, everything related to scaling performance. No, it's not. It's having its own ups and downs. So we need to know what are those things and we need to make sure uh, we know the pros, we know the cons and before we are committing to it, okay? So uh, if you want to learn more things, especially with the uh, microservice uh, fundamentals and theories, uh, go to uh, microservice.io, one of the great sites that you will see, uh, especially the patterns. Uh, you can see in here, there is a pattern section. You can see all the patterns available, uh, decomposition, data management, transition, testing, deployment, everything that you need to know. Uh, it will be at least uh, uh, some of the patterns will be there. You don't need to learn everything. Even I don't know. Uh, what you all need to know is at least, um, uh, at least the uh, things that we are using uh what are the things that you need to know if you are going into microservice at least uh, know these patterns we have to use them we have to not use them so this is a wonderful um, example use case go here and check uh, check out uh, it as well so there will be articles presentation and all those things uh, if you are new uh, probably i would uh, recommend um, uh, reading this, uh, not a lot of things are here. At least read the jinx of it, and you you guys will get how complex and how um, how uh, how these things uh, will uh, you know uh, uh, will uh, affect your knowledge and everything. So have a look around this, and. Um, you will you guys will get good idea on that and there are things like uh, cloud nativeness and kubernetes uh, these are like advanced topics but you are free to look in, into this and uh, 
especially uh, domain driven design and cqrs these are like uh, uh, architectural level things but if you are really interested in if you want to go ahead of the curve i would suggest go and learn about ddd and uh, cqrs the domain driven design will give you uh, how you can manage your microservices what are the things that you should know okay uh, per service microservice it's not going to work how you gonna uh, how you gonna uh, visualize your domain how you gonna uh, create uh, the uh, areas what, what are the things um, uh, what are the things it will make uh, how you how you think in domain patterns this will teach you guys uh, in a nice way so have a look around those things as well if you're interested in and uh, there are certain things with GRCP. Let's see if we have time. We will implement a GRCP to communicate with each other. Uh, it's going to be something um, very nice to see uh, how we can communicate with uh, services. Um, even with the uh, parallel computing, we saw some MPI implementation. Now MPI is like almost gone. We have modern things like DRCP, Kafka strings and everything. Uh, probably we'll uh, implement something so you guys know what it is and what sort of things that we can expect from that. Okay. Um, any questions up until this, guys? Any, anything that you guys need to know about the uh, microservice architecture and uh, any uh, problems that you guys come across? Okay, I hope not. Uh, so let me stop sharing and stop the recording.